It's Monday. It's October 10th. And the word of the day is sprezzatura, which means graceful performance without apparent effort. Used in a sentence, as podcasters, we aim for sprezzatura, but then we say sprezzatura, and that ruins the sprezzatura. Fuck! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Folks, the only reason the effort isn't apparent is that we added all the effort out that we can. <laughs> Said like two men who check the spelling in their notes. Can I just Fair say enough, that? yeah. I just <laughs> spell it. I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, far leftist and marijuana crusader Joe Biden. Right? <laughs> Herschel Walker will make it most of the way through this intro without a new scandal breaking. And he just said, I'm D.B. Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> but first, yeah. the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, let's start by talking about Election day, it's coming right up. I already voted by mail, super easy, didn't even need a stamp. But I feel like some people aren't very excited by, you know, voting against the very concept of evil because, you know, it's voting against. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. any candidates you guys are excited about voting for? But I, I get to vote for Stacey Abrams. I feel like I'm cheating at this Ooh, question. Stacey A. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I hate to throw off the podcast. Are you guys talking about 2024? I don't think God there is an it. election this year. <laughs> you mean, Shut the fuck With the fuck president? <laughs> don't you get to vote for Bob Menendez's kid? I in, do. In your district? Yep. <laughs> cool. Yes. Fun times. Just do it anyway. Okay. <laughs> Quick reminder on that subject. Control of the House and Senate are both up for grabs. So if you're able to afford the money for a donation or the time for some volunteering, I'm going to give you a quick handful of candidates to consider doing that for. In terms of the U.S. Senate, we got Val Dennings of Florida, Come on, Val. Raphael Warnock of Georgia Come up on, against Raph. Herschel fucking Walker, <laughs> Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada, Sherry Beasley of North Carolina, Mandela Barnes of Wisconsin, and Tim Ryan ooh, ooh, of Ohio. Show favorite. <laughs> they are all in tight races against the very concept of evil. Get excited about that, maybe. Come on. Tim did a whole ad about how his wife hates him. How can you not vote for him? <laughs> And uh, also in the U.S. House, we have some of the same situations. Consider helping out Elaine Luria in Virginia, too. Tom O'Halloran in Arizona, too. Josh Riley in New York, 19. Susan Wilde in Pennsylvania, 7. Michelle Vallejo in Texas, 15. And, of course, Mary Peltola in mm -hmm. Alaska. They just have the <laughs> one Alaska area district. She's up against Sarah Palin and, I think, one other Republican in the general. And you can find a longer list that also includes governorships and local contests, by looking up something like competitive battleground races. Check yeah. it out. Yeah, a lot of governors up for grabs. And, and, and honestly, it's, it's best to get on Stacey's good side now before she's president. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. And look, I, I just want to throw out there, I know a lot of people have sort of given up on the House as a lost cause, but as 538 reminded us on Don't their blog that. the other day, Republicans are predicted to win the House with less certainty than Hillary Clinton was expected to beat Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and it's trending in the good direction. Yes, it has right, been right. for a bit now. What we're saying is surprises happen, and I would love a good surprise in this country for once, right? Just one yeah. to mix it up a bit. Well, yeah. I think Heath's list of uh, competitive house races was exhaustive, unfortunately, <laughs> but yeah, it is, it's still up for grabs. It was close. Yeah, there were a few other ones that were like within yeah. five points. <laughs> yeah, it is up for grabs. Yes, it is. It is. Do try, it. Try, try. Please I try. Mean, Uterine autonomy is not the only thing that's at stake, but just that by itself should be enough to get yeah. you fired up. So vote, vote intelligently, more importantly, and help out however you can. And, okay, you know, do some other stuff, too. I feel like some people get get mad about this sort of message and they say, well, voting's not the only thing. Nobody reasonable is saying voting is the only thing. Just it's one of the it's. It's the easiest of the do. things, though. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. what we're asking you to do. Yeah. No, I'm not saying it's the only thing, though. Like, okay, <laughs> let's say you see Brett Kavanaugh. Here's a fun thing. <laughs> you could... Wow, he had to beep himself for that one. Okay, well, with a butternut squash, you could actually... And then you flip it, because Ooh. then you can... Well, and if you happen to have a ghost pepper handy, and who doesn't, you could also... 
<laughs> nice. Okay. All great stuff. Great ideas. I'm glad we're brainstorming here. But definitely the voting. That's the easiest <laughs> and most effective one for sure. Or you could always flip the Monopoly board like a petulant child and lose the game on purpose. Whatever yeah. you think is the best way forward. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, your choice. Anyway, in our lead story tonight, if it wasn't for the estimated 14,000 plus deaths and the omnipresent and increasing threat of nuclear conflict, Putin's bumblefuckery in Ukraine would be hilarious. But instead, it prompted President Biden to warn an audience last Thursday that the world is closer to nuclear Armageddon right now than it has been since the goddamn Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Uh, those comments came in a speech to Democratic Party donors wherein Biden warned attendees that Putin was, quote, not joking when he talks about potential use of tactical nuclear weapons or biological or chemical weapons because his military is, you might say, <laughs> significantly underperforming, end quote. Yeah, it was a weird Viagra commercial. <laughs> was a fact. Just get in side-by-side tubs already, guys. Yeah. Come on. Okay, but guys, hear me out. What if no series of bad political pivots could end the world. Like, none. Oh, like, yeah, no, not that's a possible a great thing. little pipe dream there. Uh, now, to be clear, uh, this wasn't based on any new intelligence. Uh, a fact that the White House's gaffe department was quick to clarify in the wake of the comments. Uh, <laughs> it was instead based on the publicly available information about how thoroughly the Russian army is getting its ass handed to it uh, and, and the way that their state media is being urged to say the strategic part way louder than the withdrawal part. Um <laughs> Putin's been saying since the beginning that he would use nuclear weapons to prevent an incursion into Russian territory, and as he's been making abundantly clear since 2014, he's got a real fluid definition of Russian territory, <laughs> right? Like, he doesn't let maps decide things like that for him. Uh, so I'm not a stooge for big map. Yeah, right, Absolutely exactly. Not. So, like, for example, last month when he declared the annexation of four Ukrainian regions or oblasts based on sham referendums, uh, basically, it's like... If me and my wife came over to your house to watch the game and then we declared your house ours because there are more of us in it than there are of you and your family didn't know we were holding a vote. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then Noah takes off his shirt for absolutely no reason and rides away on a horse with Lucinda. Yeah. <laughs> right. But he's also got world ending nuclear armaments. Right. That's yes, the, exactly. Yeah, I've also horse. brought dynamite to take the whole <laughs> fucking house down. Now, of course. Declaring a region part of your country is way harder when you're, like, strategically retreating from it with your tail between your legs. <laughs> that is tricky, yeah. <laughs> Which was the case mere days after Putin's declaration. Um, like, he had his little, and now all the Legos are mine ceremony on September 30th. By October 4th, The Guardian was running the headline, Russia no longer has full control of any of the four annexed Ukrainian provinces. Uh, and they even put annexed in quotes because they're shilling for big map apparently uh now for his part <laughs> ukrainian president volodymyr Zelensky used the word farce to describe the annexation okay you at least have to be in view of the annex it's yes. basic shotgun rules <laughs> right. seriously yes, everybody exactly. knows that <laughs> Uh, for his part, though, Putin's pretty sure his entire military getting its ass handed to it by a country the size of Texas for the last half of a year is mostly a personnel issue. So he responded over the weekend by firing his eighth general since the start of the invasion, as if the ninth guy up has the key strategy and or motivational speech his army's been <laughs> lacking this entire time. Uh, or actually, sorry, I, I guess the 19th guy up because the eight fired are in addition to at least 10 generals killed in the field, which is wow. fucking unheard of. Okay, at this point, it's like, you know, when a baseball team runs out of pitchers in the bullpen and the right fielder yeah. has to come in and do, like, <laughs> slow pitch in Major League Baseball? <laughs> yes. It's like, it's like that, but actually worse. Because, in this case, the entire bullpen got shot in the fucking face, and now it's just, you know, the right fielder also got shot. It's some guy sitting near the dugout who's <laughs> the general. Pitcher. You look like you got a good arm, yeah. <laughs> that is until one little boy with a dream and a specifically broken arm that committed one <laughs> hell of a war cry <laughs> stepped in. Now, Look at the year. Thank you. Of course, Putin's right in the sense that the problem is leadership, right? He's just focused at least one rung too low on that. Uh, not so much, though, with the other power brokers in Russia. We learned last week that an unnamed member of Putin's inner circle confronted him about his mishandling of the Ukraine invasion in a way that was significant enough to make it into Biden's daily intelligence briefing. And when you consider the weird ass psychotic kid with a chemistry set shit that Putin has done to his critics in the past, you got to figure shit has to get really fucking hairy before anybody's willing to confront him about it. <laughs> hey, boss, can I talk to you for a second? Uh, why am I wearing a spacesuit? Uh, let's talk about it inside. <laughs> <laughs> I will wear it throughout. Now, to his credit, while Putin has been threatening to use nuclear weapons pretty much since the conflict started, he promised only to use the little ones. 
right? He's, he's been clear that oh, that's nice. his threats are limited to the use of tactical nuclear weapons, that is, weapons designed for battlefield use, like nuclear artillery shells and short-range missiles, as opposed to the city-destroying strategic nuclear weapons we normally associate with the term. Uh, of course, given the extent to which he's used conventional artillery shells and short-range missiles against civilians and to destroy cities. I don't know what distinction he thinks he's making here, (laughs) right? But Biden's statement and the larger U.S. policy on nuclear escalation stands as a stark reminder that he probably can't let the nuclear genie halfway out of the bottle. Okay, what if now I am become death destroyer of battlefields and small cities? <laughs> right, yeah. Just the tip? Yeah. Can we do just the tip of that? <laughs> Guys, relax. When has Russia ever confused combatants and civilians? This distinction is very clear yeah, historically. Right. Don't worry. No, we're, we're safe. So yeah, uh, we're closer to nuclear Armageddon than we've been in my lifetime, and that definitely sucks, right? Especially if you're Ukrainian or Russian or Ukrainian or Russian adjacent. But if we learned anything from Stanley Kubrick and Peter Sellers, it's that just because it ends in nuclear holocaust doesn't mean it can't be hilarious. Damn right. And we really did land on the moon. And with the hopes that Putin's listening and needs someone to talk to, we're going to pause for a quick word from our first sponsor this week, BetterHelp. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And I'm No Illusions. You know, as people who professionally report on the things that upset the right wing, like black mermaids or gay dads in serial commercials, we often talk about the problems, but not the solutions. That's right, Noah. So if you find yourself deeply offended by a trans character in a Disney show or a gay kiss at the Super Bowl, we recommend therapy. That's right. Therapy isn't just a great way to keep your brain healthy. It's also an excellent way to examine your biases and unhealthy thoughts and feelings. And big it or not, if you're considering therapy, there's no better way to get help than BetterHelp Online Therapy. Oh, what's... It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists any time. Wow, rude. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. Better help, because you really shouldn't be mad about who does or doesn't play an old flute you've never heard of. The point still counts. <laughs> no, half point. And we're back. Next up in headlines in whiny little babies news. Look. One of the hardest things about doing any kind of media in 2022 is not falling for right-wing bullshit, okay? From Covington Catholic to police brutality, there's an entire media machine dedicated to drawing your attention into supporting a right-wing narrative based largely on the bad behavior of a few liberals and nothing else. But sometimes... (laughs) <laughs> Sometimes we here at the Skeptocrat have to earn our moniker of the far center by hiking our pants up to our nipples and complaining about kids these days, which yes. I will be leading the charge of with glee as my alma mater, NYU, fired their organic chemistry professor this month because his class was too hard. Yeah. It, do- it doesn't matter how many personal trainers you fire. Push-ups are still going to be just as fucking hard, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, and if doing push-ups badly could kill other people when you become a doctor in the future, yeah. maybe uh, push-ups 301 is a kind of a hard class, <laughs> yeah, and that's a good thing. Kind of the point. Right, so a little backstory here. Maitland Jones Jr. has been teaching organic chemistry for decades. First, he taught at Princeton and then at NYU. He wrote the textbook literally titled Organic Chemistry, which is now in its fifth edition, and has won multiple awards for his revolutionary approach to teaching his famously difficult subject in a manner that relies less on rote memorization and more on problem solving he sounds like an amazing professor did like that last part especially Mm -hmm. great he's won a bunch of awards for being an amazing professor but sure has but problem solving is hard or at least it was for 82 out of 350 students last spring so they wrote a petition whining about him to the university and he got fired And all the students who got bad grades in his class were offered the chance to withdraw post hoc so the grade didn't affect their average. Okay, so I feel like the 268 students who passed should, like, 
start a petition to get a bonus A then or something. Yeah, you right. think? Exactly. Right? Now, they get to kill their roommate. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yes. No, I like that. Good Automatic idea. Automatic 4.0. Everybody yes. knows that. <laughs> now, to be clear, a lot of this problem in the class was due to the pandemic, right? Obviously, last spring, teaching was a particularly unique circumstance with many classrooms attempting to be hybrid, students missing class, and the world in general turmoil. But as both Maitland and his assistant professor point out, he actually went over and above for his students during COVID. He taped 52 organic chem lectures for students and spent $5,000 of his own money to do it. The problem was the kids just weren't showing up. As Maitland put it, quote, they weren't coming to class, that's for sure, because I can count the house. They weren't watching the videos and they weren't able to answer the questions, end quote. Okay, seems pretty clear. So I feel like med schools are aware that plenty of good potential doctors can get one bad grade during undergrad. I feel like that's known. But to whatever extent that isn't the case, I do hope we evolve in that direction. But regardless... So many solutions to this are not firing the amazing teacher. Right, yes. NYU could adjust that guy's grading curve if they want. Um, they could still do the free withdraw post hoc thing and not fire the guy. Or maybe, maybe just maybe, everyone can't go to Harvard or Johns Hopkins Med School and not fire the guy. <laughs> All of them are not fire the guy. Okay, so one last thing about this story that I just have to bring up. Uh, as Heath has hinted at a couple of times now, one of the major complaints in the petition was that the bad grades in Maiton's class were going to prevent these students from going to medical school. Because, Good. you know, medical school and the profession of medicine itself are so famous for how easy and undemanding they well, are. Well, yeah, that's the point of making organic. I mean, organic chemistry is just hard all by itself, but that is kind of the point. It's that so, so that final class. So, like, I feel like a quarter of people who want to become doctors probably are too stupid to do it, right? Like, that's my experience with doctors who made it to doctorhood. For sure. <laughs> I would love for that to be reflected in the academic requirements. <laughs> also, one other rule. I think the people who fired this guy have to use those 82 failing students as their doctors <laughs> in the future when those people become doctors. And look. It's easy to read this story and think like, ah, oh, kids these days and shake your fist at a local skateboard park. But <laughs> let me give you my honest take on this situation. And everyone like it, you're likely to read in the next couple of years as someone who's actually in a classroom in a, I don't know, somewhat regular basis. Gen Z, the kids these days, they're fine. Some of them are assholes, yes, but everyone was an asshole when they're in college. That's why we lock them in universities. It's for <laughs> our protection, right? What is unprecedented right now is the vacuous terror of those assholes by the boomers who are heads of these departments, yes. right? You have never seen a more cowardly bunch of pussies than the fearful white people who run today's universities. And they're so terrified of being wrong about anything that they instantly admit they're wrong about everything in the desperate hope they won't get caught well so yeah to be clear the students who signed the petition didn't want the dude fired and were shocked when he was yeah he was fired because the administrators decided that he was causing too much administrative work he was fired because of lazy boomers and lazy gen xers not because the kids these days are entitled Exactly. Also, yeah. I think a bunch of the kids who do love this professor also did a petition and were like, no, he's amazing. The, yes! Some of these yeah, people yeah. failed and they're mm -hmm. being whiny. Yeah. So, yeah, if in a couple of years you're walking down the streets of New York and you get hit by a bus and you're rushed to the emergency room, when that OR doctor looks down at you and says, wow, this is actually a lot right now. I need to make a weepy <laughs> TikTok in the hallway real quick. <laughs> Make sure your loved ones send a thank you note to the administrators at the ever so prestigious New York University. <laughs> Go Violets. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Is their mascot really a flower known for its bashfulness? Because that's way too apropos at the moment. It sure is, Noah. It sure is. God, the funniest part is that actually it's a bobcat, but the students refuse to acknowledge it. Yeah, I, yeah I, I almost wrote in the whole complicated story, but it's fucking incredible. We have, we have literally, I don't even know what it is. We've done like some kind of China, communist China, like destroying of history of the bobcat. It's just, it's just the violets. People boo him at games. It's the best. <laughs> All right, go Bobcat Violets. Good job. Violets! And in area mandamus news. Well done. We have a story about the Supreme Court, the Onion, and the best 
amicus brief ever filed. The headline from the New York Times reads, Area Man is arrested for parody. The Onion files a Supreme Court brief. The Area Man is Anthony Novak of Parma, Ohio, and he was arrested and jailed for creating a parody Facebook page of his local shitty police department. He was put on trial for using a computer to disrupt police functions, but he was found not guilty. And then he sued the city for putting him in jail because they were mad about being satirized. That lawsuit was dismissed by a federal judge, and that federal judge's ruling was upheld on appeal by a different judge. So now, Mr. Novak is hoping to have the Supreme Court uphold the very first goddamn amendment and fix this. And of course, the ultimate ally for a person thrown in jail for satirical jokes is The Onion. And The Onion filed the brief in support of the Supreme Court hearing the case granting cert. Yeah. Come on, Scotus, get this one right. You you already came for atheism. You come from satire, too, and we might have nothing left but a flying pug and dramatic mid-question pauses. What's <laughs> a series of targeted... <laughs> well, you have what? More points than Heath what, what did Eli just say? That got beeped. <laughs> so, before we get into the amazing amicus brief, let's consider the original alleged crime. Novak made a very obviously fake version of a Facebook page for the local cops. It had ridiculous posts that said things like, the city is planning to ban the feeding of homeless people in hopes of having the homeless population move away due to starvation. Another post was announcing officials stay inside and catch up with family day in order to reduce future crime, <laughs> adding that anyone who goes outside that day will be arrested on the spot. And at the very top of the very first page, the parody account said, Parma Police Department, we know crime, spelled N-O, exact words. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm still against arresting the guy, but this is whatever the next level up from criminally bad satire is. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to give notes, Tony, <laughs> but you can do better. No, I mean, to be fair, it is hard to satirize cops without accidentally quoting the police union. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fair. No, that's fair. Okay, if he got found guilty because it wasn't funny, I might support <laughs> the decision, but like, that's not what happened. So, based on that page, the Parma police claimed they received 11 phone calls to a non-emergency line from people either narking on Mr. Novak or asking questions about, you know, the legal technicalities of tearing up Wonder Bread for ducks when homeless people are nearby. <laughs> I think they're lying. I think the police department's lying about that. But they claimed that 11 non-emergency phone calls happened, which disrupted the department so hard that they could not fight crime. 11 fucking calls. 11 phone calls to some number that's not 911. Yeah. So they showed up at Novak's apartment. They seized all his electronics they charged him with a felony, Jesus. and they put him in jail for four days before he made bail. And that last part about what the cops did, that does sound like it was disrupting cops from fighting actual crime. So I feel like we did find a criminal, but well, not so, him. Yeah, well, that's it. Maybe they were just trying to disprove his we know crime tagline. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and now the Supreme Court is going to rule the uh, sacred and invaluable nature of cop fifis. So, yeah, yeah. yeah they are. <laughs> so when you're submitting an amicus brief, the thing is you have to establish that you represent an interested party. So Mike Gillis, head writer for The Onion, who wrote the brief, basically explained Hey, so according to these federal judges, my entire job is illegal, a felony, apparently. So our interest is that we're interested why these judges are fucking stupid. Eh, paraphrasing. And then he pointed out how the Supreme Court has upheld the right to parody in just about every single related case in history. Sorry, decisis, Latin, right in your fascia. And I'm only, again, I'm only slightly paraphrasing. At one point, the brief has a section with the heading... It should be obvious that parodists cannot be prosecuted for telling a joke with a straight face. That was a whole section in the amicus brief. And that section includes a full paragraph of nothing but legal nerd Latin phrases, which was fun. And then he explains, again, approximate quote. OK, you guys see what happened there? We were talking about a real thing. And then we did a self-referential not real thing in the business. We call that a joke. Gillis also added, and this is an exact quote. It would not have worked quite as well if this brief had said, Hello there, reader judges. We're about to write an amicus brief about the value of parody. Buckle up, because we're going to be doing some fairly outré things, including commenting on this text's form itself. Be ready. 
Okay, look, I love a meta bit, but it takes a true legend to do a meta bit while your very existence and thus meta-ness is at risk. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's bold, right? Absolutely. The brief also argued, again, paraphrasing, that stupid Republicans, like, you know, just about every single cop in Parma, Ohio, I'm sure, they're going to get parody wrong sometimes. But that doesn't void the First Amendment just because stupid people got embarrassed about reading badly. And Gillis mentioned the example of GOP Congressman John Fleming <laughs> reading an article from The Onion and then warning his constituents in all seriousness about Planned Parenthood opening an $8 billion abortion plex. Abortion <laughs> exact word. I've been sent that article so many times by people who didn't realize. Like, so many conservatives have been embarrassed by accidentally taking that seriously. I am pretty sure we could get away with opening an $8 billion abortion plex at this point with no real pushback. <laughs> we might as well now, right? You, got, you know in some meetings, someone at Planned Parenthood has been like, I mean, why don't we sell baby parts, right? They're saying we do. <laughs> Someone probably wants to buy them, right? Perverts, cooks. I'm just saying, can we look into it? Can we look? No, it's no again. Okay. It's ethical. You use the whole deer. Yeah. So the general concept is that parody, by nature, has to seem somewhat realistic, at least for a short time, in order to function. And it's an important tool of healthy political dissent. So... We can't have fascist idiots making laws that require a giant sign at the top that says this is parody at the top of everything that might be parody. Certainly not for some guy who basically already did that parody sign with we know crime at the top of his page <laughs> that was making fun of the shitty cops in his town. And bottom line, if the people in your town think your police department actually might be making a law against giving food to a homeless person ever... <laughs> The solution is to stop being evil pieces of shit for whom that tracks, yeah. <laughs> not throwing a guy in jail for a Facebook post. Right. Also, you're not allowed to make laws when you're too dumb to get jokes, right? We we can't reduce discourse down to knock knock and identify as a helicopter for your Uncle Frank. Like this, we can't. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> yeah. So great job by Mike Gillis and the team at the Onion. If you want to read the whole brief, definitely worth it. Check out the link in the show notes. Highly recommend. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, HelloFresh. Eli, please, you got to make something else. I told you I can't. Yes, you can. Literally just use the ingredients any other way. Same hey, ingredients guys, even. Guys, what's with all the hubbub? Eli's caught in a cooking trap. Wait, what's a cooking trap? Oh, you know, where you cook the same meal over and over again because you know that one recipe. If I have to eat chili one more time, I'm literally going to turn inside out. You are not. Yes, I literally am. Guys, guys, if you're looking to spice up your weeknight cooking schedule, why don't you just try HelloFresh? Oh, what? With HelloFresh, Hello you Fre get farm fresh what is happening? ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Plus, HelloFresh is now offering vegan recipes on the menu every single week, made without animal products of any kind, like dairy, meat, eggs, or even honey. Enjoy meals like sweet chili tofu bowls or spicy coconut curry stir-fry. That sounds good, but how do I know it's not going to get, you know, um, samey? Well, with 30-plus weekly recipes to choose from, HelloFresh has something for everyone. Easily customize your meals by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading to choice proteins, or adding proteins to a veggie meal. It's true. I signed up for HelloFresh when they became a sponsor. The meals are delicious and the variety is amazing. All right, I'm sold. How do I sign up? Go to HelloFresh.com slash Skeptocrat65 and use the code Skeptocrat65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Skeptocrat65 and use code Skeptocrat65 for 65% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh. Never say chili again. Again. My chili is delicious. I'm literally dying from it. Fine. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Walker X, a stranger news. Fantastic. <laughs> Herschel Walker is very nearly the worst candidate for anything ever. He's dishonest, callous, incomprehensible, scandal ridden, inexperienced, malicious and stupid. But it may be that the most impactful controversy of his campaign could come from the one non shitty thing he ever did. 
or rather that he was ever alleged to do because he denies ever having done a non-shitty thing and has threatened to sue anyone who claims otherwise. <laughs> uh, the act I'm referring to, of course, is the time the guy campaigning on a total abortion ban paid for an abortion back in 2009. Yeah, he was also valedictorian of the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> He's choking on a cookie. Choking on a cookie. He's choking on a cookie. So yeah, He's the David the, Ike of America, for right? sure. Right? Woof. So, yeah, so this was first reported by the Daily Beast. According to their report, an unnamed woman claimed that Herschel Walker got her pregnant in 2009. Uh, he urged her to get an abortion, then reimbursed her for the procedure. Uh, she backed this claim up, by the way, with a receipt from the abortion clinic, a bank deposit receipt that included a copy of the check from Walker shortly thereafter, and a get well card that he presumably sent along with the check. When asked why she came forward when she did, she cited Walker's hardline anti-abortion position and added, quote, I just can't with the hypocrisy anymore. We all deserve better, end quote. And, and let's be clear about the level of hypocrisy that we're talking about here, right? So a lot of GOP candidates in tight races have been trying to avoid the topic of abortion, uh, even to the point of removing harsh anti-abortion language from their websites in many instances. Herschel Walker, on the other hand, has leaned into it. He supports a total abortion ban, both statewide and federally, that makes no exception for rape, incest, or danger to the life of the mother. All of which, by the way, Walker dismissed as, quote, excuses, adding, quote, there's no exception in my mind. Like I say, I believe in life. I believe in life, end quote. Uh, except, of course, when it would potentially lead to his fifth set of child support payments, or sixth or 23rd. We, we, we really don't know at this point. <laughs> Now, it's super duper clear that he definitely paid for this woman's abortion. She also told the New York Times that he urged her to have another abortion a couple years later, and she refused. So yeah, chalk that up as another undisclosed love child, I guess. And despite these facts, and the fact that she's a registered Democrat, she says that Walker's campaign has repeatedly contacted her in hopes that she could vouch for his character. Which means, what? yeah, when he was asked by his staff if there was any women who might be willing to publicly say that he wasn't a shitheaded asshole, he listed a woman whose abortion he paid for and with whom he had another undisclosed kid. And I, I, like, I don't know if she's high on that list or if they just already exhausted an awful lot of names before her, but I also don't know which one of those would be better, right? Okay, let's be fair, though. Sometimes people get confused. You know, what happens is, the good air floats away to China, mm -hmm. and then the bad air has to move over here. It has to go somewhere. It moves over here. Brains get foggy. Okay, no. <laughs> yeah, no, from the bad air. I get okay, it. but honestly, Herschel Walker is so stupid he thinks his exes like him is a perfect summary of how yeah. stupid Herschel Walker is. Yeah. Can we just also do a quick summary of the other lies that were kind of mentioned here? He actually claimed he was top 1% in his class. Nope. Not the valedictorian of the FBI either. He wasn't in the FBI. He didn't even no. graduate from the class he said he was in the top 1% of. He says no. he has multiple personality disorder like Jesus. Yep. We, yep. This is going to be the rest of the podcast, Heath. We can't, <laughs> yeah. we can't go through the list. <laughs> okay, just last one. Mention it for a second. He actually said the good air floats away from America to China, and then their bad air has to go somewhere. It goes here because we made empty airspace. And it, the bad mm -hmm. flies in. Yeah, yeah. And look, we're talking about one of, if not the most important Senate race in the country here. Okay, according to 538's forecast, if Walker wins in Georgia, Republicans have a 60% chance of taking the Senate. If his opponent, Raphael Warnock, wins, the Democrats have an 89% chance of keeping it. Those are the stakes in this election. And again, Walker is among the least qualified people to ever represent a major party on a senatorial ticket. Might be the least qualified. Now, the, now, the polls have moved a bit since this story broke, and that's encouraging. Uh, Warnock has been holding a slim polling lead since Walker won the primary, and it's gotten less slim. But holy shit, like this is one of those Biden-Trump type elections where even a slim victory for the good guy is a moral loss for the nation. This should be a fucking blowout. And in Smokey Joe and the Bandit news, 79-year-old Joe Biden has officially done more for marijuana justice reform than your crunchy Russian robot retweeting Green Party <laughs> voting cousin ever will do in their entire useless life, and nothing will ever be more funny to me. Me too, me too, man, and not just because of the celebratory bong hits that I've been smoking sequentially since this news. <laughs> okay, Eli turned 35 two weeks ago. When he turned 35, he immediately started yelling at a cloud to get off his lawn, apparently. <laughs> now he's yelling at NYU kids and progressives. He's 
printing paper tickets for the airport. <laughs> like old, just that day. The machines might be broken, Heath. You don't know. <laughs> so weird tubes of ointment all the time. <laughs> so here's the story. Um, your cousin was born to the relative privilege of what Damien Reckons calls hideable minority, which means instead of developing empathy, they develop the entitlement of white people plus the bitter nihilism of a post-oppression minority. It anyway, long story short, they started defining themselves politically, not by progress, but by moral purity. E Eli. So, sorry. Oh, right. Anyways, st the real story. Um, anyways, that super old guy who wasn't so sure about desegregating the fucking schools before your cousin was born pardoned thousands of people convicted of marijuana possession under federal law. That's about 6,500 people for those keeping count. And said his administration would review whether marijuana should still be in the same legal category as drugs like heroin and LSD. In short... Joe Biden is actually significantly more progressive than your cousin. Your cousin has failed to rise to the <laughs> level of Joe Biden's progressivism. Yeah. And and I'll I'll have to double check with Andrew when he gets back, but I'm pretty sure that like legally speaking, this means I should smoke all of my weed exclusively at the post office now. <laughs> <laughs> Or you can actually just keep jumping back and forth across a state line. Yes, and yep, you do oh, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On an airplane. Yeah. Now, don't just worry. Just taunting the local cops. <laughs> oh, you're, you're arresting me anyway. Okay, oh. you're both <laughs> arresting me. Fuck. Now, don't worry. Your cousin's not going to go like crazy and change their mind or anything. This move is imperfect in a lot of ways. Uh, it doesn't cover selling marijuana. It doesn't pardon illegal immigrants who were convicted of possession. And it doesn't pardon people who violated state possession laws. Though Biden did encourage state governors to follow his lead. And doubtless the governors of many progressive states will do that. And quick reminder, in more than two thirds of the states, you get a chance to elect a governor next month. So, yeah, are you guys sure that's this year? I, I will murder you. Four. <laughs> anyway, all that said, Joseph Haberdasher Biden <laughs> is the legalization president by any honest definition. And if next time you go into your cousin's dorm, they don't have a poster of him up next to the homophobic guy from Cuba, you should break their Steven Universe bobbleheads. <laughs> what? And finally tonight, a flutist played the flute, Anna. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. Superstar singer-songwriter, classically trained flautist, and national treasure Lizzo played a 200-year-old crystal flute during a concert in Washington, D.C. that was lent to her by the Library of Congress. And bigots all over the country had a collective meltdown. We don't have a bigot freakout jingle yet. Maybe we can make that happen. But Christian is close enough and pretty much covers the same group of Americans who had the freakout. So I feel like it's fine. Yeah. I mean, at a certain point, the jingles would just get redundant. He, right. He yeah. To... We don't need all of the synonyms for Christian. <laughs> all right. So just in case anybody missed it, here's the backstory. The flute was originally gifted to President James Madison in 1813 by French craftsman Claude Laurent to celebrate Madison's second term. The following year, the White House, then known as the President's Mansion, was set on fire by British forces as part of the War of 1812, and the only two artifacts that got saved were a portrait of George Washington and this crystal flute. So the flute got preserved by the Library of Congress, and then it just sat there for over 200 years. And then it finally got some attention last month. Upon hearing that Lizzo was coming to D.C., Librarian of Congress Carla Hayden sent a tweet inviting Lizzo to have a tour of their flute collection, which happens to have over 2,000 pieces. They wow. get a lot of gift flutes at the White House, I guess. And to Carla Hayden's surprise, Lizzo responded, I'm coming, Carla, and I'm playing that crystal flute because Lizzo is a delight. Yes, and a classically trained, multi-frame competent flautist, right? Everyone's acting like they just chucked a Stradivarius to Rihanna because she's famous. Yeah. It's not... Well, but, to, but also, but even if they fucking did, so what? Nobody would have given a fuck if she was white famous. No, when yeah, when Yo-Yo exactly. Ma goes and plays the Stradivariuses, they like do it as a fun press opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's what this lady was doing. And they're like, yeah, but you know. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> right, so during the concert, Lizzo gave the audience a quick rundown of the flute's history and then played it on stage. Lizzo also danced, you know, because music, Stage performance, dancing sometimes. And that was the problem. The dancing included a move that 
I believe the kids are calling it the twerk. <gasps> and that is critical race theory, which is illegal. <laughs> no, it's not. This is fucking dumb. So just to be clear, the panicky freakouts are saying the problem was the twerking. And that sounds slightly less stupid and horrible than the actual problem. They're lying. The actual problem is an extremely successful and talented black woman was... Um, was Lizzo was yep, yep. That's the problem. is the problem and you might be wondering if James Madison was a flute player when you heard this no he was not he was huh. not Lizzo was the very first person to play the flute that was otherwise just sitting there in a case really so this is awesome yeah also I mean if I have to choose between slaveholder James Madison and sexy dance lady Lizzo for whose existence offends me more the answer might <laughs> shock you <laughs> uh, well and also to be clear the twerking bit was an ad hoc rationalization that they tacked on at the end when they realized that otherwise they were just mad at a black lady for being black right exactly exactly so one of the freakouts came from Conceptual desiccant Ben Shapiro, <laughs> founder of alt-right lying site, The Daily Wire. Shapiro said, this Lizzo flute controversy is a perfect example of what I have termed face tattoo phenomenon trademark sign. It's not a trademark. I'm going to use it. The phenomenon whereby someone does something deliberately controversial in an attempt to draw attention and then acts offended when you notice he also added that Lizzo's outfit was not appropriately modest. So I guess he has a modesty line in his head for playing a slave owner's old ass flute. Huh. And this violated that line. I'm sorry. Really, Ben Shapiro? You're going to talk about people doing things for attention? Yeah, right. <laughs> the, the man who built his career by taking clips of college students out of context so you could seem like you pwned them and then said your wife told you a wet vagina was a disease. <laughs> you made a video just buying one piece of wood at Home Depot yep. for attention. That's yep. what you did. Yeah. We also got a freak out from translucent fish fucker Matt Walsh. <laughs> That's right. Matt Walsh fucks dead fish. That's real. That statement is clinically tested. Yeah. Clinically tested statement. Matt Walsh fucks dead fish. And Ant has the same truth value as literally every claim Matt Walsh has ever made. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Matt Walsh, he's the assistant to the regional deskant at the Daily Wire. So <laughs> according to Walsh, Lizzo playing James Madison's flute was a form of racial retribution according to the woke left. Really? Okay, look, Matt. We're never going to see racial retribution, and I, I don't think anyone really is, but Matt, buddy, if it does, they're um, they're not going to play our flute unless that's a, <laughs> a very graphic <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> so yeah, uh, slavery, pretty bad, but now we're all squaresies after the flute retribution. <laughs> cool. Tied. Tied. Yep. Yeah. And of course, we got a bunch more terrified conservative hot takes that I'll, I'll just sum them all up for you right now. Collective freak out composite quote. Here we go. I'm proud American, and my patriotism has always been defined by a crystal flute that I just now learned about, and the twerk is disrespectful to our troops. I'm crying. Why am I crying? I'm weeping. And um, <laughs> Lizzo, just so you know, you probably already know this, but just in case you don't, they're crying because they love you, and it terrifies them. Yeah. yeah here, here. I've been there. Also, just sorry, I have to add one more detail to this. Not for nothing, you can actually Google the concert Lizzo played at the Library of Congress, which is what she had originally intended to do. It was the librarian of Congress's idea for her to take it on stage with her that night. So just, again, it's yep. fine. Yep. It's fine. Also, check out Lizzo's Tiny Desk concert. It oh. was great. Oh, she should do another one where she's at Trump's tiny little desk. Yes. <laughs> that stupid little desk he did. Yeah. But yes, great concert, Tiny Just Desk. Donating for racist sure. instruments to Lizzo to destroy yeah. <laughs> on stage, like the fucking doors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. Thanks to Lizzo for existing. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like 
all the generous new donors, you will be complimented genitalially in the future. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Skating Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. You can't possibly have thought that wasn't not confusing. I don't think anything was confusing about you that. You were like, start Zedcaster and also regular recording. Pause in three, two, one. This is, you were trapping me. No, were you able to follow my uh, complicated I was, directions? I, w- I followed along. I did God not it, follow no, along with, I did not follow along with Eli's response when he says you can't <laughs> not have not thought that wasn't not confusing that, or that whatever added to the confusion. <laughs> I was in a rage because I was in a white hot rage. Uh huh. No, I get unlike it. Unlike man or beast has ever experienced. I get it. I get it. The preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.